Hey guys, welcome back to Pop My Up Chem. This is the second video of Unit 3 and 13, and we're going to be looking at the periodic table's chemical trends in this video, building on what we did on the structure of the periodic table and the physical trends in the previous video. So give the questions a go based on looking at trends in ionization energy, and then we're gonna start looking at the noble gases and why they are part of the key to understanding the chemical trends. Pause the video and have a go. Okay, so defining ionization energy, remember we need one mole of a gaseous atom that loses an electron and forms one mole of a gaseous one plus ion with one electron. The two main factors that affect ionization energy are our effective nuclear charge, the charge on the nucleus, and the number of electron shells, the principal quantum number. Let's first take a peek at the noble gases. So the noble gases are group 18 on the periodic table and they have a few features which can help us understand the chemical reactivity of other elements. They are colorless, unreactive, and they have a stable octet, apart from helium, which is the exception, but that still has a stable full principal quantum number. They're monoatomic, as in they exist as one atom, unlike other non-metal gases, which are diatomic. We have argon and neon exist as individual atoms by themselves because that full outer shell is so energetically favorable. So we can consider this as kind of like a model to explain the reactivity of the other groups. If we look, for example, at alkali metals, alkali metals are group one. They only have one electron in the outer shell. And so this is lithium, sodium, potassium, etc. And these elements are too reactive to be found in nature just by themselves. They're only found in compounds. In terms of their physical properties, they are good conductors of heat. They are not very dense, so low density in fact that they float on water. They are very shiny, although the shiny surface created when we cut them uh, quickly oxidizes in the air, so it dulls quickly. And they're obviously good conductors of electricity being metals. Their chemical properties are very reactive. They form ionic compounds with non-metals and they, being in group one, only form singly charged positive ions and it doesn't take a lot of energy to remove that individual electron giving them low ionization energies. And this reactivity that they have increases as we go down the group. So we'll look at two common reactions of alkali metals. We'll look at the reaction of alkali metals with water. So alkali metals are so reactive that they do not need any ignition source. They react directly with water to form the metal hydroxide and hydrogen gas. So in general, we could say M solid plus H2O goes to MOH aqueous plus hydrogen gas. For example, lithium reacts with water to form lithium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. The second common reaction is their reaction with the halogens. So that's group seven or 17. And these react very violently to form the metal halide. So in general, we could say M solid plus X2 gas goes to MX solid, the solid salt, you can balance the equation there. So sodium reacts with chlorine to form sodium chloride solid, which you may know as common table salt. In the first reaction, we can actually test for the presence of hydrogen using the very technically named squeaky pop test for hydrogen. It's a very simple qualitative test in which wherever we've reacted the alkali metal with water, we collect a sample of the gas that is produced from the reaction with the alkali metal and the water. And once we've got enough gas in our upturned test tube or something the like, we take a lit splint, so something on fire, match or splint, 
and then we put that lit splint in the test tube and if there is hydrogen present then it will combust and give a squeaky whoop sound. So this could be used alongside pH to give a qualitative demonstration that there's been a reaction of an alkali metal take place. Oh, and just notice I didn't balance the equations up there. Okay, a couple of quick questions on that so far before we look at the halogens. First question, what gives noble gases their stability? Pause the video to have a go at that. Pop them up. Of course, it's the full octet, their full outer shell that makes them so stable. Have a go at writing a balanced equation for the reaction of potassium with water. Pause the video. Pop them up. So remember with the alkali metals reacting with water, you're always going to form the metal hydroxide and hydrogen gas. And don't forget to balance your equation at the end. So how could we go about testing if a reaction with alkali metals and water had occurred if we weren't around for the reaction? Pause the video to have a go. Pop them up. Well, we could of course test the pH of the solution as they are alkali. And if the gas was collected, then we could also do a squeaky pop test on the collected gas to see if there is hydrogen present. Let's turn our attention to the halogens, which have seven electrons in the outer shell, group seven or 17. These all exist as diatomic molecules, X2. They are all colored and the color varies as we go down the group. We have fluorine being yellow, chlorine being green or greeny yellow. We have bromine being a brown and we have iodine being a silverish kind of color. In terms of their chemical properties, these are very reactive non-metals. But unlike the alkali metals, their reactivity decreases down the group. All of them react with metals to form ionic compounds, such as the key reaction we looked at earlier on of the reaction with group 1 alkali metals and group 17 halogens to form metal halide salts. The halogens undergo displacement reactions, which helps us to outline the reactivity going down the group. And this is because a halogen ion that is less reactive will give up its electrons to an atomic halogen that is more reactive. So here we can see bromine coming in as atomic bromine and displacing the Na plus ion from the NaI molecule to form I2 because bromine is more reactive and so displaces the iodine. Iodine is lower down in the pecking order. The inverse is also true. If we add an atomic halogen, such as iodine, do the inverse of this reaction to NaBr, there will be no reaction because iodine is less reactive than bromine and so therefore cannot displace it. So we have an order, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. The more reactive, the more it will displace other halogens. If we take out the spectator ion of sodium, we can see this makes a lot more sense when we think about the size of the atoms, because here we have big iodine negatively charged atoms interact with bromine. Bromine wants or is able to pull those electrons towards its nuclei more because it is smaller, it has a lower principal quantum number and so the left to right reaction is possible but the right to left is not possible because larger atoms have less attraction to their outer electrons and this explains us why we get the displacement order in the group 17 elements and 
We also have a qualitative test that is able to help us actually differentiate between these halogens. So all of the halogens chlorine downwards react with silver ions, that's Ag plus ions, and we can use this reaction as a qualitative assessment of the presence of chloride, bromide, and iodide ions. And this is because they all form solid precipitates and these precipitates differ in their color very slightly. So if we add silver nitrate solution to a solution we suspect contains some halogen ions, there are three outcomes. If we first get a solid white precipitate, which actually is a little harder to draw in here than I thought, then that is a sign of the presence of chloride ions, Cl minus ions. If we form an off-white precipitate, that's kind of a not quite gray, but not very pure white precipitate, that's the formation of silver bromide precipitate, which indicates that we had the presence of Br minus ions in the solution. Lastly, if the precipitate we formed is a yellow kind of precipitate, that is the formation of AGI and tells us there was some I minus ions, some iodide ions in the solution. Okay, a couple of summary questions on that then. What happens to the reactivity of the halides as you go down the group? Pause the video and have a moment. Pop them up. Okay, well, as we go down the group, we obviously get larger. Hopefully I'm sounding repetitive by this point. That means the electrons are further away from the nucleus and it's harder for them to attract new electrons and therefore the reactivity decreases as we go down the group. Next question, a bit more specific. Would chlorine displace bromide ions? Pause the video. Pop them up! Chlorine is of course above bromine in the group and therefore is more reactive. So yes, it will displace bromide ions. And now you know that, have a go at writing the equation for the single displacement reaction of sodium bromide solution and chlorine gas. Pop them up! So you're going to have sodium bromide aqueous NaBr plus Cl2 aqueous is bubbled through and that displaces the bromide into bromine so we end up with NaCl aqueous and bromine aqueous and quickly balance that with your twos. And following this reaction further what color change would you expect to see if we bubbled chlorine gas through NaBr solution? Pause the video to have a think. Pop them up. So let's get the equation that we already wrote and have a look at what's on either side. On the left, we have chlorine, which we know is a yellow green. So we're gonna have a yellow green solution. On the right hand side, we know that bromine is brown. So we're gonna have a brown solution. Okay, so there's no worksheet directly on this, but it will support what we were doing in the last video and in next video. Thanks for joining me, guys. Don't forget, like, subscribe, get the bell icon. And as always, practice makes slightly better.